Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Right, cool. Okay. Um, yeah, so my name's Alan Day. I work for Red Hat as part of their design desktop team. I also contribute to, to GNOME Design, and I'm part of the GNOME Design team. And i um, been doing that for a fair while. Um, so this talk kind of came about because over the past year I've been thinking a fair amount about... Um, my own design practice and trying to put that in the context of UX strategy and market strategy and been doing a whole bunch of reading and thinking and writing about that and about development and design process and things like that. So I've been working on this for about a year and I kind of wanted to share what I think I've kind of learned over that time. Um, I also wanted to uh, take the opportunity to talk about the work that the design team has been doing. So they've been doing some like, amazing work over the past year. I'm hopefully going to try and connect those things together. So I'm going to talk a bit about kind of uh, strategy and where I think GNOME needs to go. And then I'm going to talk about some of the ongoing work we've got and how that kind of fits into that and how that's maybe the start of a kind of plan for moving forward. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, maybe how we can go about that, some process stuff. So there's, there's about four talks here, and I'm going to try really hard to get it all done in the time, but I might have to kind of go pretty fast and skip over it a lot, so um, apologies for that. Um, so yeah, um, a lot of the work that I'm going to be presenting here isn't just my work, it's the work of the whole team. Um, and there's more people involved than there are here, <laughs> than there are on this slide, including the orange dot over there. Um, but uh, these, these people deserve special thanks. So that's uh, Jakob, who just presented, Sam, who sadly isn't here, and Tobias, who's down here as well. And like, A lot of what I'm going to present, particularly later, is very much um, thanks to all their work. So they deserve lots of kudos for that. Um, Yes, although the views and opinions here are my own, uh, a slight disclaimer. Um, okay, so uh, let's talk strategy. Um, I don't have time to like present like a detailed kind of UX strategy or product strategy, um, but it is something I've been working on a little bit, and I've got some kind of just very high level kind of comments to to make about that, just to give you a kind of flavour. Um, First point, like the desktop lives, like, you know, like this thing with like, um, you know, a landscape display and a keyboard and a mouse, people keep saying it's going to go away and then it doesn't go away. So like this thing is around and it, and it, I think it, it matters, it's important. And um, if you look at like the sales figures and things like that, you know, like the, they haven't always been fantastic, but they haven't been terrible either. Um, so I think the, the point here is there is an active market out there. It's not going away, and it is important. So I think in that regard, like purely in terms of this form factor, um, there is a market there for, for known to target, and it's, that's important. And that doesn't mean to say that other form factors aren't relevant either, but you know, this is our traditional, traditional space. Um, Next point, uh, there's this thing called the cloud. Um, some of you might have heard of it, I, I don't know. Um, but, um, you know, in some respects, GNOME has been a little bit insulated from the cloud, and that's probably uh, not a great thing. But um, it has reconfigured the landscape that we're operating in, and whatever strategy we have has to take the cloud into account, I think. I think that's really important. Um, one of the most obvious things there is that, well, most of the key apps that people use nowadays are cloud-based. Right, like, you know, they're using Gmail and they're using Spotify and they're using Facebook and they're using GitHub and this is the things that they care about, and they can use those whatever platform they're on. Um, so that has like, that's like a double-edged sword for us. On the one hand, it's an amazing opportunity because actually it makes uh, GNOME and the Linux desktop far more competitive than it ever has been before because. You know, people can migrate to, to Linux and still use all the same apps that they're always using. So that's kind of amazing. And 
is like a real opportunity for us. Even though like as kind of desktop people, we might not feel really enthusiastic about that. It could be like a massive win for us in terms of user base. And the flip side of this, of course, is that if people are using less of the software that we make that is like you know native using our platform, then it becomes harder for us to tell a compelling story about ourselves. And um, I, th I have answers to that. I think a lot of the people in this room will have answers to that. But it is a, it's a challenge, and um, it's, again, it's something we've got to think about when we talk about strategy. Um, third kind of high-level kind of market strategy point. Um, there is a gap in the market. Like, um, one of the things I've been doing is this, as a part of this kind of exercise over the past year is actually going out and speaking to, to users, um, like people for, who are using different platforms and kind of doing kind of fairly detailed uh, interviews with them about what they're using and why. Because I think it's kind of important to understand that, right? Um, and, you know, I don't have time to go into all of that now, but I think one of the really clear things that came out of that to me is that actually there is like a real opportunity in that market for a project like GNOME to really kind of meet the needs of users whose needs aren't really being met currently by any of the main market players. Um, so without naming names, um, <laughs> you know, when you talk to people about, well, you know, why are you using this particular laptop? Why are you using this operating system? They will talk to you about things like something that they want something that's easy to use, they want something that's reliable, you know, that they can install apps and software on and doesn't break and doesn't slow down and doesn't get bugs and doesn't get viruses. Um, cost is a major factor, you know, unless your company is buying your laptop, you know, actually how much it costs is quite an important factor. And um, I wrote trust there, but I think that's kind of comes under a broader category of brand. But, you know, I think most of the, you know, the, the big players, they're associated with major brands and I think a lot of people don't feel particularly comfortable about some of those brands and try to distance themselves from them rather than associate themselves with them. And then I've put desktopiness, which is really kind of more saying, I think a lot of people are kind of looking for a device that they have control over um, rather than being more of a kind of consumer device. Um, so there's a lot of requirements there. And when you actually look at the competitors in the market, none of, they're all kind of got gaps. Some of them cover some points, but not others. And I think like, no one could actually check all those boxes. And if we did that, we would be able to target certain, certain sectors of the market, certainly uh, more effective than, than, than our other rivals. Um, final point about the, the environment we're working in. OK isn't good enough anymore. I mean, like, I think in the past we got away with being OK, because like, the rest of the industry was generally pretty bad. But it's got a lot better now. It's, um, you know, the standard of UX and products that are out there that people are walking around with in their pockets. Um, it's got a lot better. And so we have to get better too if we're going to kind of get people excited about what we're doing. So that's a real challenge. You know, it's, we've really got to think seriously about how we can actually get the quality level up so we're at that level where people can genuinely be excited about it and genuinely compare it to some of the other products that they're using. Um, yeah, so I, th I think that kind of the main takeaway here is, you know, there are opportunities and there's a fairly major opportunity if we're able to capitalize on it. Um, but there is a problem and the problem is the one that we all know about, which is um, priorities and resources. And, you know, the GNOME community is pretty small, right? And we're an old project, we're like 22 years old, yay. Um, and so we've got a lot of code to maintain. And so it's really hard to take on new challenges and to raise quality and do all the things that we want to do. So if we're going to have a UX strategy or a product strategy, we need to think about resources and we need to like seriously think about resources. Um, there are obvious things we can do here, like we can do less and like we can have some really hard, make some really hard choices and we can talk about software that we're not actually going to care about anymore in order to make the stuff that we do care about better. Um, we can prioritize. Um, you know, we can make sure that we prioritize the most important stuff first. And I think like um, 
a good product strategy or UX strategy can help us to prioritize. So, you know, I think there are just basic principles there, you know, like work on the stuff that people use the most first. <laughs> and, um, you know, when you're deciding on which feature to implement, you know, do data gathering, like see, like, who, you know, what's going to be most popular with your user base. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we can do around there to prioritize more effectively. Um, and then the final thing, of course, is to grow the network. So if our resources are fairly limited, then the obvious thing to do is to get more people writing for our platform. And that's something that the project is already working on and doing pretty well at. But, um, you know, more third-party apps, more community apps. So, like, we're kind of growing the net resources that are being plowed into our platform, even if we're as this kind of relatively kind of cohesive community, let's say, um, is, is relatively small. So you kind of take all of that. You can see why I'm having to move quickly here. Um, and you kind of, if you were to boil it down into a kind of UX strategy, I think I would probably do something that looks a bit like this. Um, and some of the things on there are fairly obvious, like we need to support hardware, because like you need to run on hardware. But um, some of the things um, I think deserve more attention, and the one that I particularly kind of feel passionate about and want to talk about for a lot of the rest of the talk is this, this top item, which is improving quality. And, um, you know, when I talk about quality, I mean kind of through all its dimensions, whether it's, um, you know, uh, how, how the UI looks, how the software behaves, but also how reliable and stable and performant it is. Uh, so it's the quality of design and execution. And this really does matter. You know, you go out and you talk to people and, 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 you know, it's something that they care about. You know, they, people really do just want something that works. And I think that's something that the known project for a long time has recognized but maybe hasn't always managed to fully deliver on, I would say. Like, um, and it's, so I, I really think that kind of quality is, is, is critical at all of this. Um, so, where am I? Yeah. So... What I'm going to talk about next is some of the work that the design team has been doing, and particularly the work that fits into that kind of vision. Um, so, um, you know, over the past year when I've been doing design work, um, I've been thinking very much about these high-level goals and how the particular design initiatives that we do uh, trans translate into those goals. And so I'm selecting some of that work here to show you, to, to see how it might look in practice. Um, and I said before that, you know, the design team has also been involved in this. And though the strategy stuff, I haven't discussed them, I think a lot of these kind of points, they probably agree with implicitly, certainly the, the, the quality angle. Um, so if we're going to, if we're going to um, prioritize, um, you know, one of the places to start is the core system, right? It's like the basic stuff that everyone uses, because you know, if you spend time improving that, then that's something that uh, all your users are using all the time. So they're all going to be ex exposed to those improvements rather than if you go and work on niche features that only a small percentage of your users are exposed to. And over the past year, we've, I think, reviewed and done new design work for a lot of this. So um, we've got designs for a new lock screen and login experience. And um, this is actually a few years old, but we keep going back to it and we keep talking about it and keep trying to improve it. And, you know, the key thing here is, is just refining the user experience, you know, um, making it feel smoother, more beautiful. We're fixing some kind of practical issues as we go along here, but, you know, the real thing is just setting the tone for the encounter, driving up the overall level of quality, improving the the way people feel about the experience, because this is something you do all the time, every day. So if it doesn't feel smooth and great, then that's going to translate into how you feel about the product as a whole, right? Um, uh, we've been revisiting certain aspects of the core shell um, with a view to modernizing them and updating them. Um, these are mock-ups for the notification list and the calendar that you're probably all familiar with. Um, 
there's a certain amount of kind of just visual glossing here, you know, it's making it better laid out, easier to read, um, nicer looking. But there's also some kind of uh, practical in improvements as well, functional improvements, you know, uh, adding do not disturb, we're indicating the origin of, the, of each notification. And this is really intended as just a first step and there's subsequent work that we would like to do and that's probably true of most of the designs I'm, I'm showing today. We're kind of trying to uh, look at this kind of progressively. Um, so there's other things we'd like to look at like grouping the notifications, like enabling people to take actions on notifications while they're in the list. Uh, I think features like notifications are a, a key place where the desktop can add value because it's clearly a system thing rather than an, an app thing. Um, similar story with the, the system menu, um, just refining it, making some options more obvious that are currently um, a little undiscoverable. That's something else we've got in the works. Um, Im just improving all the dialogues, like they're pretty inconsistent and don't always look great. So we have, um, Design, new design patterns for all of this, which are fairly uh, rigorously specified, and um, there's a small bit of in-progress work. But you can see we're trying to harmonize the look, make everything just feel more polished, more consistent, more integrated. Um, so that's work that's ongoing. And then we've also been looking at the core apps. Um, and again, here, you know, um, I think from my perspective, the key thing is prioritizing and focusing on the thing that people use the most and getting all those core utilities just as nice as they possibly can be. Um, so things like just if you want to view a PDF, you know, simple things, but it's not something that we've done a great job of delivering a quality experience on. So we've done a little bit of work, little bit of work on that. We've got a lot more to do. We've got um, designs and, you know, I'm just showing kind of um, a single image for each of these, but there's more design work behind them. There's wireframes with kind of uh, a lot more detail. Uh, same with image viewing. Um, you know, really just basic things that people use all the time, getting them so they perform really nicely. And so they look and behave like they belong together rather than kind of coming from different worlds. And if you kind of go back, there's, we're trying to kind of use the same design patterns so that they feel like a family of applications rather than being just kind of random. Um, one key thing is here is we desperately want editing in here. Like, you know, I've spoken to GNOME users who just have desperate problems just performing simple image editing tasks because we don't actually provide that function functionality right now. Something very basic, a clear value add that we can be doing that, which um, I think I really think we ought to be working on and. Yeah, again, we have designs for this. Um, we've been refreshing a lot of our other application designs for the core apps. Uh, this is Clocks, just trying to simplify and make it into a neat, small, pretty utility. Um, uh, uh, again, uh, Weather, another one, which quality isn't quite there at the moment, let's say. And we've got a whole new set of designs for this, which would love to refresh. And, you know, if we don't have the resources to refresh these, then maybe that's the time we have conversations about, do we actually care about these apps? Because if we can't deliver the quality, it's often better not to have them than um, to have them at all. And, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other application designs that I could have shown here that I haven't. We've got updated designs for notes, um, others which I can't now remember. And the other thing that we've been looking at is um, the platform and the design system. Because if you're going to prioritize, one of the things you can prioritize is on the things that people are exposed to the most and they use the most. But the other thing you can focus on are the uh, common, common libraries and frameworks that are used by all the applications. Because if you kind of improve those, then you improve everything else. Um, and you know, if you were in the room earlier, you will know that um, about the application work that Jakob and Tobias and others have been doing, and you'll know that the focus of that work isn't so much about kind of pretty icons, it's about making the tooling better, making the experience either 
treating applications as part of the platform. And we're doing the same thing for uh, symbolics as we are for the full color icons. So introducing tooling to make it easy to find these assets, create new ones. And the other thing that we've been focusing on, which I've been more involved in and which I believe is really important, is actually properly supporting our design patterns. Because <laughs> right now, a lot of the things that we have in our designs aren't in GTK, or they can't easily be implemented, um, which from an application developer perspective is, is pretty bad because it makes the platform uh, rather unapproachable, but it's also bad from a, a quality point of view because uh, a lot of these things are being hand-rolled each time, so they're inconsistent, they're not as polished as they should be. So we're actually going through the process right now of reviewing all our design patterns, figuring out what the level of support is, and kind of trying to plan with developers for how to kind of have full, proper support so these things can be readily consumed by application developers and hopefully readily discovered as well. So we've got uh, new designs for menus. You'd think menus, we've got menus, but <laughs> we've got a lot of different styles of menu, uh, and they're not all the same. Um, Drop-down lists, um, again, something we've got new mock-ups for. We'd love to see a new widget for that to, to supplement or you know, theoretically replace combo boxes. Lists, comple uh, complex design pattern where we've done a lot of work and we continue to argue a little bit about the details, but uh, we're mostly there and um, that's something we would really like people to be able to just kind of um, work out the box rather than having to create it one widget at a time. And then finally, in-app notifications, which are another thing which has a fair amount of complexity at the moment that application developers have to deal with. We really want this to be as simple as sending a regular notification. You know, it's, it's a simple call. Um, so that's some of the work that we've been doing that I think kind of fits into the kind of strategic vision of where I, I, I'd like to see the project going, uh, driving up quality, reviewing the most essential common parts of the, the system and the platform, uh, to, to make it as, as, as great as it can be. Um, so that's a lot of kind of why and how, what, well, why and what, I should say. But there's also the how, which is you know, how we actually deliver these things, because you can have all the you know, amazing, like, fancy, pretty mock-ups and skilled developers and all the rest of it, but you can still then kind of fail on the implementation if you, if you don't get your process right. And um, uh, this is another thing I've been looking at over the past year and been doing a few experiments, particularly with help from other people in the community. Um, and I think this is the other thing we need to focus on, because if you're going to drive a quality, you need to get the process right to enable you to effectively deliver each time. You can't afford to be investing time and energy into new um, user experience initiatives and then not deliver at the end, deliver something that's substandard. And, and I think that's why, you know, the process really matters. Um, so in what remains of this, I think I've gone through it kind of pretty quickly so I can slow down a bit maybe. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I think makes an effective um, user experience process and... Um, how we can maybe leverage that to, to increase quality and, and deliver a, a really compelling product. Um, and the, the first point here is iterate or iteration, which is you know, a common part of design processes and is really important for design, but it's also important for implementation and, and development. And I think one of the key things that uh, we can do better is um, plan around iteration, uh, plan around feedback loops. So if you're working on a new, uh, um, if you're a developer and you're working on a new project and you're thinking about how much time it's going to take, the point of to where you get up to the first implementation is only a small portion of that process, right? And you need to be planning your time in order to 
allow those feedback loops and that iteration to take place. And I've, you know, I've been involved in um, projects where this hasn't happened, and the, the first thing that lands is the thing that gets released. And I think that's something that we, we really need to av avoid um, at all costs, because that's when things that aren't great end up in users' hands. And uh, the worst thing that can happen is that gets released, and then you don't touch it again. And I think some of the worst bits of user experience that we have in Gnome are a result of this problem. So when you plan, plan to iterate, plan to rewrite it, plan to rewrite it twice or three times, you know. And if that means you can't do as much, well, you know, that's okay if what you're doing is that comes out at the end of it is really good. You know, I think that's the thing about producing high-quality uh, user experiences, it's maybe about doing less, but doing them better. Uh, the other thing that we can do as a part of iteration and feedback processes, I actually do testing. And this is something that I worked with uh, Clarissa with, if Clarissa's in the room, she was doing uh, usability testing for us. One of the key things we did with her internship, um, in contrast to other ones that we've done in the past, is that we tested the code while it was in development rather than testing software that had already been released. And we tried to get into this pattern of, you know, um, make some changes, test them with users, get the feedback, change the implementation, test it again. Which, you know, common industry practice, but it's not something we generally do in, in the known projects. And um, I think that's something we need to be getting into more and more. And, it's not actually that hard. It takes a bit of time and effort, but it's, it's well within our grasp to do something like that. And I think we learned important lessons through Clarissa's internship as to how we can go about doing that in the future. Uh, so the second point here is mixing it up. And um, what I mean by that is uh, closing the gap between design and development. Because I think a lot of the problems in, with quality happen when that gap exists. Um, and what you end up with in that situation is you end up with uh, designs that don't reflect how the technology works, or you end up with the implementation that doesn't quite match the design somehow, and, and things kind of fall short of where they're supposed to be, and you end up with something that doesn't really make sense. Um, and this is, you know, this is a challenge, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a constant battle, but I think it's something that we can improve on by improving our process. Uh, and there's a few different ways we can do that. Um, I've got this point here, kind of uh, developer designer synchronicity, but that basically just means talk to each other, like a lot. Uh, <laughs> so the worst thing that can happen with a, a, a new UX project is a, a designer goes into a hole and they do a pretty mock-up and they give it to a developer. And then the developer goes into a little hole and they come back a month later and they say, ta-da, it's done. And then the designer says, what, the, what is that? <laughs> you know. Um, so we need to prevent that from happening. And the way we prevent that from happening is by talking at all steps of the way and testing at all steps of the way and really approaching these user experience initiatives as team, uh, team initiatives rather than individuals passing artifacts back and forth. Um, and, you know, other than just talking to each other, there's kind of things we can do there and around our pro process, like, you know, uh, making sure that we're, we're testing and, um, and uh, you know, another thing potentially is kind of having actually kind of a named lead, lead designer and a lead developer on everything that we do so we can actually know who's supposed to be talking to each other rather than this kind of nebulous design team which no one quite knows who, who's kind of who to talk to. Um, the other thing, um, the next item on my list here is um, uh, designer developers, which is something I'm, I'm pretty into at the moment. Um, I think another way we can really effectively close the gap between design and development is by um, us designers actually getting our hands dirty and touching the code. Um, <laughs> Which, you know, there's loads of ways we can do that. We can, um, you know, we can be touching the code as part of UI reviews. So kind of simple UI changes we can be making ourselves as a part of that process. You know, uh, editing, whether it's UI files or CSS or kind of simple coding changes. Like, there's no reason why us designers shouldn't be doing that. Um, 
We can also be using it for prototyping, you know. Um, I think prototyping using GTK ought to be a, a real goal that we have rather than um, using other tools. Uh, and this brings lots of kind of benefits. There's like efficiency benefits because rather than as designers saying, yeah, can you shave two pixels off that? No, actually, can you make it four pixels and shift it up a bit to the left? We can actually just go in and do that ourselves, which like, saves everyone time. Um, the other positive benefit is that um, it teaches us designers about what the development process is like, which um, one kind of makes us want to make it better, so it makes us more mindful of the application developer experience and how it needs to be improved and makes us focus on that. Also ensures that our designs are mindful of the constraints of the platform, so if, if we kind of know what the toolkit particularly can and can't do, then that will ensure that we produce better designs. Um, so to do this, you know, us designers need to spend the time and the effort to get involved and rather than filing issues, start filing merge requests, which is something that I think is a really positive thing for us to be doing. Um, but we also need help from developers and we particularly need your help in making your software approachable for us. So that means using GTK Builder, using CSS, and wherever possible using high-level languages. Because you will, you will get a result from that. You will get MRs. You'll certainly get MRs from me, and I would hope you would start getting them from the rest of the team as well. But if, if, I, if I look at a repository and it's just written in C, and there's no UI files and there's no CSS, that's not something I can easily touch. So. You know, we, we, we need help from developers to enable this to happen. Um, my final point here is kind of it says sprint. Um, this is about how we manage our time. And um, we've been doing some experiments prompted by George's, uh, George's experiments, not ours, but I think they've been very successful. And, and that's just about blocking out your time. So a lot of these things can be facilitated if we know in advance what's coming. So George's will come to us and say, right, um, in two weeks' time, I'm going to spend a week working on the control center. And what are we going to achieve during that week? And we can plan it, and we can make sure the designs are in place, and we can have our testing set up so that we can give feedback, and we can be, you know, we can schedule in reviews for Wednesday or something. You know, um, all of those things are enabled by blocking out time and planning it ahead of time. And we can also kind of fit our designs to the amount of developer resources that are available. So if we know we've got a week of George's time, we can make sure that our designs can be implemented in a week rather than giving him designs that require a month's work and we end up with something half-baked to the end of it. So um, having kind of short contained sprints and having those planned with the design team in advance can then facilitate all of these other things from to happen. And I'd really encourage... Uh, developers in the room to kind of try and take those approaches and talk to us about how we can do them better. And potentially with all of this, you know, we can try and um, develop better processes and have kind of, um, kind of good, good practice that we spread throughout the project. So um, that's the talk, and um, I went through it far too quickly, so I'd appreciate lots of questions. But um, I guess the conclusion is, well, one, there is a market out there. You know, I think we've got a real opportunity as the known project, and we should real, feel really excited about where we are in the market right now. Like, um, we're actually in a pretty good place, but we do actually have to deliver uh, and successfully target that market segment if we are going to succeed. Um, point two, the, the design team has all the answers. Um, <laughs> By what I mean by that is we are primed, we're ready, like we've got the design work, we're keen to work on this, we've got assets and we've got the enthusiasm and we just need the rest of the community to come and work with us and if anything comes out of this talk, I'd like it to be that, you know, come and work with us, let's make all this real and, you know, I, with the research I've done and the people I've spoken to, I'm pretty confident that we could do pretty well out of this. Uh, so, yeah, let's go and make design uh, gnome awesome but remember... The process defines the product, so take time on the process, think about your process. You know, we need to have the care and the, and the, and the forethought about what we're doing in order to make sure we execute and, and make something really great that users want to use. So that's the talk.
So this is uh, pretty recent news. Uh, GitLab 12.2 was just released, I think yesterday, day before yesterday. Um, and part of their big push on GitLab is uh, making design-focused workflows more readily available. Like right now, instead of just p pasting designs into issues, like into comments on an issue, now there's going to be a new tab specifically for design mockups. Um, that leads me to the question, um, GitLab has said that they want to iterate further and add more design-focused features. Do you, what's your experience with GitLab? Do you think it's been great? What things would you like to see there? I mean, it's, it's been amazing for design because, um, you know, so many conversations that have mo moved to GitLab that were kind of elsewhere and kind of buried have been surfaced and facilitated. And we, we're actually, one thing that we're able to do now that we weren't in the past is actually we have kind of a staging area in our own team and repos there that we're able to iterate on designs before we push them out to a development repository rather than um, having the churn happening. So we can, we can keep the churn confined to ourselves rather than exposing de developers to it because that can be really confusing if you're seeing lots of iterations of a design and you don't really know well, when it's ready, like we can we can actually mark that point. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, other members of the, the the team will comment on this. I think like the the commenting and the design review whole part of it could be improved. Like just being able to post screenshots and you, there is some limited functionality there, but it, it leads kind of a, leaves a lot to them to be designed desired. Uh, yeah. Uh, am I am I doing this? So there's Cosimo and then there's Ian. I can, I can so my question is, um, how do you like? How do you scale? Like, I really liked that idea that you had at the end with the example of you know uh, George's. It's like, oh, I have I, I have like you know some time a week to spend on Control Center. Uh, what can I do? But it feels to me that that model is kind of backwards compared to what you want. It like. Um, I recently was, uh, you know, in Italy, and I had uh, like a bunch of friends that work for a software company, and they're like, "Well, we have, you know, this uh, almost like a 20% time that we can use, however we want, to work on like, you know, free software projects uh, in the summer. We want to do something for GNOME. What can we do?" And I had a hard, actually a hard time giving them like a good answer for what uh, would have been like the most meaningful use of their time. Like, I, I think, you know, it would be interesting almost like you know to 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 share that with the community to say like okay you know here's here's like the top five things that we really want mm. to see and you know these are done designs like you know we just need somebody to do it and i think that um you know you you, you could like scale it better if you like i don't know if you have any other ideas about that yeah i mean the key thing there is knowing how much developer time a particular design task requires and that's something that we often don't intuitively know on the design side. So we could advertise particular design tasks and kind of give a rough idea of how what's involved in terms of the, 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 the scope on the technical side, but I think that would need developers to, to assist us in kind of scoping out those tasks, uh, which, you know, that's what happens inside companies and organizations, right? When you take on a on a new task, you kind of, figure out roughly what kind of resource it's going to require to, to do it. Um, and one of the trickier things there is that, you know, that when I talk about synchronicity, I think one of the things that we need to be doing is, you know, like de designing to the abilities of the developer. And so if we're doing all our design work up front, that you can't do that so well. Like, um, I, would, I would sooner move forward at, 
at the pace of the resources we have available rather than come up with like, amazing fancy mock-ups that no one has a, a chance of implementing because it would take them years of work you know um, so maybe I don't know maybe we need to work in both directions I, I guess, but, um, yeah I think help with scoping from maintainers would be really useful right yeah I'm I need to blog more <laughs> <laughs> Just to add a comment about that, there's a lot of old design resources like wikis and GitHub, and it's we kind of need to remove all that old stuff and just have like this is where design stuff is. Yeah, I mean, some of that's just kind of archive reference material, so it's, it's, it's nice to keep around, but having a highly visible kind of short list of this is where you go to find new tasks and I don't know. We've, we've tried doing this before, and I know how quickly task lists and to-do lists and status, you know, tracking the status of individual applications and modules, it gets stale so quickly that I, I'm, I'm reluctant to do anything too complex there, but something simple like uh, the, these are the five top priorities right now and what will be involved kind of thing could be very effective. I guess. And maybe we just need a disclaimer on everything else saying this is probably old and crusty and please go and talk to someone in design before. You know, I'd say that, that's it. the bit that's missing is this old stuff that you don't know is old unless you know, oh, that is old. You know, yeah, there's no, yeah. There's no yeah. signposting to say, you know, go away, this is not the, this is archive. Yeah, but you can have a link to the, the, the page with all the cool stuff that you should be doing, so yeah. that's fine. <laughs> Uh, Ian has had a question. Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. It was very really great and really good food for thought. And there was a few things I thought about asking you about, but your last slide has made me decide this question. Um, it's about the process I wanted to talk about was the, the whole GNOME release process, the time-based nature of it. And I wonder if maybe maybe that sort of influences the way that people work. So I, the, at least the way that it influences me is that I feel like I have to land... If I want to land something, it has to basically be done before the feature freeze, done, and then after that, I fix I fix it up, right? And I and I wonder if that's perhaps um, that kind of pressure to get maybe get something landed rather than nothing, or you know, is is leading to some of the problems that you're thinking about, and maybe maybe it's time to think about whether the time-based releases that we have are serving us well, and whether you have any thoughts on if you, if that's something you or anyone here has thought about whether we should consider at all. It's definitely an issue and definitely a lot of the problems I was talking about are often uh, the, the deadlines are, are definitely associated with them like trying to get work landed in time and um, you know, part of that is the real world you know people do need to land features and <laughs> um, but the schedule is something that we've invented in the project about right? quality but um, yeah I, I don't have any specific points about what we should be doing but it's certainly an issue I mean, there's been talk about should we go to a like TikTok kind of schedule, or but I don't know that how much that helps particularly. But. Yeah, well, like the whole the idea that we have to release every component simultaneously all of the time. Like may, maybe they are just working at different rates. Their maintainers are doing different things. Like perhaps, I mean, perhaps. Isol app isolation helps with that um, in the sense that. I don't think applications nowadays have to obey the six-month rule yeah. as much as they used to, but... Um, it feels like that's what the GNOME projects are still telling them to do, though. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. from the release team with a hand up at the back. Yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we have a release team both uh, during the both days, but um, there is no obligation to release every six months. Uh, if you want to skip a release, it's perfectly fine. Um, we are we're not going to chase you uh, with flame with flaming torches and pitchforks. It's perfectly fine. Um, what we, as a release team, usually ask is just that if you do a release, you stick to the plan. But other than that, it's entirely up to you um, if you want to do a release. So don't worry about that. <laughs> I mean, I guess the problem is less with feeling that you have to release and more that you have to get a feature done by a particular time in order to get it into user, the hands of users. The, the time is there just 
to give you to give us a rough like idea of when we can use this feature but again uh, so from personal experience is never the release team or the project that says uh, you need to release it's your boss that says we need to release um, so that is sadly out of our hands uh, unless you all start working for GNOME in which case we get uh, we need a lot more money <laughs> Um, yeah, um, great talk. Uh, to be fair, in, in last four or five years, I have never seen any problems with UI of the base of the GNOME in general. So I think it might be we are going just over the same things over and over again. <laughs> the biggest issue for me has been I've been recently looking at that from third party software development point of view. And the biggest issue is that if you want to design your application that looks so nicely as the rest of the GNOME, it is quite hard to do. There are no, no nice way to get understanding how the UI guidelines work, or there are no easy way to mock up things. The only way you can mock up is GTK Builder. And or or Glade. So basically, it's kind. It's the tool is great, but for mocking up things, it's quite difficult to do so. And that's the biggest challenge, actually, from U, uh, UA point of view, because core is great. There's no problem with that. The third party applications is where the problem lies. You want to field them as the part of the GNOME, and to field them that way, we need refined process for outside developers to being able to do that efficiently, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think there are things we can and should and need to improve about the, the core system, but, uh, um, and I think those are things that will resonate with users, but um, to answer the, the second part of your question, I mean, yeah, I, we agree, and I think we're all kind of painfully aware of this. Um, I think the first step in that is actually to technically support the design patterns because it's, it's it doesn't there's no point in me going and spending uh, three or four weeks updating the design guidelines if people can't then go and easily implement what's in the design guidelines. So that really is the first phase of this work, and um, and it really and everything else needs to flow from that really. So that's that's one of the reasons why I'm. I'm I'm so passionate about that particular initiative. And once you've got that, then things become a lot easier because you can have demos and templates and um, you, can, you, can, you can write your design guidelines. And I know we'd, we'd love to work on that, but really we need to start supporting the design, <laughs> the design patterns first. Otherwise, none of it really counts for very much. Uh, Tobias maybe has something to say about that. Uh, yeah. Well, not particularly about this, but about the thing that was mentioned before about like the release process and uh, kind of like I, I was thinking a lot about what you said about iteration, where like when when really good things sort of, well when the result is really good it tends to be like because we iterated on it a lot and there are some things where we can do that and there are others where we kind of can't because I mean there's like the shell and GDM and stuff like that that unless you have JH built. There's kind of like no way to test it, and that generally ends up meaning that until Fedora Rawhide gets it, no one has seen it. <laughs> yeah. And like, I mean, I'm not sure if like that's strictly related to the release process, or I mean, it goes back to the old GNOME OS question. Yeah. But like that, it would be really good to figure that out for all of sort of. I mean, I think settings now sort of is available as a flatback kind of to test. And so it's getting a little bit better for the more appy core system components, but the stuff like the shell is still like off limits. So a couple of yeah. release team people yeah. waving their hands again. So you're going to provide are, us with continuous images yeah. again, right? The VMs are coming back. Yes. Yay! <laughs> That's great. Awesome. That's great. 
another thought related to that is, you know, kind of like riffing on the re on the release question. Like what I, I've seen it many times happening, right? When something lands like on a dot ninety or something like that, and you, like like you said, and then there's there's just very little time for iteration, um, and then you know the, the 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 default inertia is that it, it will stay like that, and then maybe you know it will it will be six months later until until users will see uh, a real improvement on that feature. So how do you have any suggestions for how that can be improved, right? Like do you, you know do you test branches do you you know uh have some kind of like design input in the release process that can like revert or block features if they're not you know considered finished like what what is what could be a good way to avoid that problem because i've seen it happen you know over and over i mean only you know all the things i've already talked about you know i mean i think if it means spending longer on a feature then it it takes longer and i think Going into feature development with the expectation of that iteration will happen in the first implementation is like the first of three or four or five or six or how many it takes to get it right. Um, and, and if you're kind of racing to try and get something finished for a release, you should know that it's, you know, that is not the way it should be done and that's not the best practice. And we, we, we have a picture of the design and development process, which um, forms our expectations for, for, for what that process will look like and, and, and not be kind of just kind of merging new features right at the last minute. Um, but I, I know that keeping things in branches uh, has some trade-offs and um, that's, that's a challenge, but I, I don't particularly have any input on that other than from a design point of view kind of keeping new features separate and, and working on them and getting feedback and testing them. That's all stuff that I'm super enthusiastic about. I think we should be doing more. Use your CI pipeline to build a flat pack bundle and let people download it as yeah. an artifact. Do that, that, that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, are we out of time now? I would like a flat pack bundle for the shell. <laughs> I have a question too. I'm sort of in the corner here, so sorry. Um, You've talked, uh, this is maybe counter to what you've been talking about of like focusing less on things or, or I guess narrowing your scope. Um, but I'm curious about how the design team um, fosters sort of innovation in their process and like, um, you know, any, uh, I think that we want to keep a small design team and have, you know, um, tight design guidelines and things like that, but what are the ways that the de design team specifically um, looks for innovation within the core platform and other ways? You mean in innovation like new features or? New features, new technologies, just like accepting I or trying to seek out, um, yeah, sort of innovation within the platform space. And I guess the question there too is like, how can newcomers get involved in this? I know that you don't want too many, you know, Oh, we will not designers. I'm, I'm, stuff, but... <laughs> we're all happy to have new designers, believe me. Uh, there's, there's no, no uh, hesitation about that at all. Um, innovation, honestly, I'm, 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 I'm not particularly sure about that. I mean, you know, my, my focus is quality and making things just work and making them beautiful and, you know, Maybe that's just a personal thing, and maybe others are better at thinking about new cool features, but the, the thing I really want to nail is this kind of, just make it work. Just make it work nice. And, um, and, and don't make people have to think about the technology, you know. Um, certainly, like, innovation is cool, and, and we need to think about new features. Um, and I, you know, I think I would go back to this point about prioritization there, you know, like, who is this benefiting? What are their problems? And, uh, you know, kind of some of the work I've been doing around kind of interviewing and getting to know users and what their kind of real life challenges are is, is, is powerful there. Um, but the message I generally got was just like, I just want to be able to install stuff and not break. And like, I want to be able to afford something that looks nice and doesn't get viruses. <laughs> so that's kind of what I'm focused on trying to provide. You know. Yeah, sorry, I forgot you. Um, 
uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, we'll gn we'll gonna try to uh, make some radical changes in the future. Or we will it try to cater to users that are used to the workflow of GNOME? <laughs> um, I mean. Certainly, there's some things that we've got in the pipe that could be a little bit more dramatic, but I, you know, I think we're definitely kind of more mindful of the kind of disruption that comes with change, and we're I think we're better at managing that that we used used to be. But definitely, there's kind of stuff around the shell that we're working with George's, where like I think we've got like a lot of ideas and concepts, and I I think the thing. The thing is, like, when you change things, they have to be obviously better to users. <laughs> and if they're not, then that's when you run into trouble. So, like, I would hope that any major changes that we do bring in, we're going to be changing things that obviously just people don't love at the moment. And we're, like, really going to work really hard on making sure that the new thing is something that they do really love and they really recognize the value of that. And I think that's the key thing, like, being actually... You know, just really mindful of what people value and what's important to them. And when I, you know, I had in the UX, the UX strategy slide, one of the five points is add value. It was add value to the cloud, but I think just in general, like the mantra is just in general, like add value for our users so that it's kind of recognized and so they kind of see kind of what the benefit is. I think that's really important. Cool. All right. You. Um, sorry, George has got a question, but I. Out of time, have we got quick, quick? I don't know if it's gonna, that's going to be quick, but I'll try. Um, oh God, one minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my God. So, um, to me, it feels um, it feels like um, you no. Know, one, one of the, the gems of our community is the design process that we have. And not not only the designers as the, the humans behind the design process, but in the process itself. Um, but there's one thing that I feel that um, I, I feel some sort of lack, uh, which is um, user testing. Because the impression that I have is that it happens in bursts. So we get a, a bunch of user testing and then some silence after that. And then... Usually that happens as the result of outreachy or such kind of program. Um, I want oh my god! Uh, I wonder if y you can think of ways of in um, making the user testing part of things um, yeah, you know, more mean, integrated. The, the, you know, I said before, like there are things we can do there. It's it's within our grasp. It is work, but it's not like an unrealizable thing to do. And. Um, there's a lot of techniques that are used out there in the industry that we can definitely take advantage of. You know, like lean, lightweight user testing is very much the mantra of like most of the tech industry. So there is actually kind of things we can do there that you know other people have tried and tested. So like, you know, like oh, that was it. I remembered like we needed a design tool and I couldn't remember what it was, but we need like a remote U UX testing app. Yes. So. Yeah, so this is it. So we get like a bank of like testers and we have them kind of on call and when we've got something to test, we kind of made it available and they download the flat pack and then they run this little app and record their thing and then we watch them all do it and then we'll know. Yes. So we just need to do that. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. We now have a one-hour break for lunch. Uh, talks will resume at 2.30 p.m. <laughs>